CMOS scaling has enabled tremendous information processing on a single die. But ultimately, information needs to move between chips through the array of pads provided for input and output, I.O. The task of transporting information between chips is, in many and an increasing number of cases, outstripping the task of processing the information in terms of one or more of the following. Energy consumption, design effort, yield, die area, design risk, and test time. Here's a plot of published wireline transceivers at VLSI Symposium and ISSCC over the past two decades. You see there's a wide distribution of publications, but a clear trend towards increasing data rate at a rate of a factor of two every five years. Obviously, this is being driven in part by process technology scaling. So here we see a similar plot plotted on a, a log scale on the y-axis. So that data rate is doubling for every major grid line here and versus process technology node on the x-axis. Again, you see a clear trend in the publications doubling in data rate every two technology nodes, roughly corresponding to five years. Conventional IO is carried between chips on printed circuit boards that are manufactured with low cost, high volume, mature processes. Unfortunately, signal integrity becomes challenging, particularly at and above 200 gigabits per second. Improving signal integrity entails high power consumption in the I.O. circuits. The resulting high power density on these chips and in the overall system increases the system's cost for power delivery and cooling. And in some cases, communicating chips at the required data rates and at the attendant power dissipations may be just completely infeasible. Finally. In some situations, conventional packaging and PCB technology limits the bandwidth density of the I.O. That is the number of gigabits per second that can be communicated per unit area on the chips or board unacceptably. To maximize the aggregate I.O. bandwidth given a limited number of connections between chips, we take multiple data streams operating at the chip's internal clock frequencies, for example, around a gigahertz, and combine them into a single data stream at a much higher rate, up to 200 or more gigabits per second. This requires a serializer at the transmitter and a deserializer at the receiver, called collectively SIRDES for short. The resulting very high frequencies that arise between chips require that the interconnect be treated as a terminated transmission line. Operating at the extremely high frequencies of modern wireline links, which are actually microwave or even millimeter wave frequencies, the transmission line between chips exhibits frequency dependent losses. Here we focus on the two most significant sources of frequency dependent loss. First, let's consider the skin effect. This causes a concentration of current along the surface of conductors at very high frequencies. Since the current is now flowing through a reduced cross sectional area, this increases the series impedance, the inductance and resistance of the conductor. Secondly, we should note that quickly alternating electromagnetic fields arise in the dielectric in these uh, waveguides. This causes the dielectric materials to heat up the same way our chicken heats up in a microwave when we expose it to quickly alternating microwave fields. That heating is an indication that some energy is being dissipated at high frequencies, and this gives rise to an additional source of frequency dependent loss. Here's a plot of the channel, a typical channel response versus frequency going up to 20 gigahertz. And you see the effects of skin effect and dielectric loss. Skin effect is generally visible at lower frequencies where we see the curve rolling off at 3 dB per octave or 10 dB per decade. At higher frequencies, dielectric loss begins to dominate. It gives rise to a higher roll off or higher slope in the frequency dependent loss. 6 dB per octave or minus 20 dB per decade. We may categorize channels by their attenuation or loss at one half the symbol rate or also called the Nyquist rate. So in this example plot that's 16 gigahertz. So in this example there's four different channels with different lengths. 
channel A is a relatively short link having less than 10 dB loss at the Nyquist rate. Such links are often referred to as extra short reach XSR or very short reach VSR links with reference to the standards that govern such links. Channel C here has more loss and generally fits into the category of uh, medium reach or MR links. Channels with 30 dB or more loss at Nyquist are often considered LR or long reach channels. Now, data communicated over such links can be thought of as a sequence of pulses neighboring in time. So for example, we may be communicating a one bit with a positive going pulse, and then that may be followed by a zero bit with a negative going pulse as shown here. Remember that at high data rates, these pulses are very narrow in time, so that we can pack a lot of data over this link. And the channel's low pass filtering effects cause these narrow pulses to spread out in time and overlap with each other. So if we imagine the received waveform at this point in time right here, it would be a superposition of the red and blue waveforms. So you can imagine that with a bit of noise in the system, it might be hard for the receiver to tell whether a positive or a negative going pulse was transmitted. This interference of neighboring pulses is called intersymbol interference or ISI.